You know, it's interesting to, to sit in the audience, listen to Paul, listen to Karen, and think about my remarks to you, and I probably shouldn't be spending the time, but I'm going to depart from my script a little bit, uh, because one of the things they've done is given me an out for some of the material. They've already covered a lot of it. But one of the things that occurred to me about the last two talks and maybe you think about this, because how many of you are primarily here to think about acquisition concerns in Agile? Anybody? A couple. A few. Well, and maybe for those of you who are but just are bashful or can't get your hand up, one of the things you might think about, so the NGA um, presentation just now, are you trying to transform your entire enterprise to have it embrace Agile principles and adopt practices that are going to implement those kinds of principles? Or are you an acquisition organization that's trying to figure out how to interface with an Agile development organization and do some acquisition? And I think those are very different kinds of perceptions perspectives and objectives for how you might take away the information that's being provided here today. So I just offer that up because it just hit me and I thought I'd share that. Um, on for my part of the show. I think I'm going to do this. Okay. <laughs> okay. So couple of topics that I'm going to go through here. How good is Agile? Is it right for all circumstances? Must it be done in a pure form? What do I got to do to be successful? So some of this you've already heard. Um, but Mary Ann said, I'm a measurement person. I've been around the SEI now for 21 years. My focus has primarily been on process improvement and a lot of the time has spent, been spent doing various kinds of empirical studies. Um, and I have to say, part of what I've heard is not so different from other journeys that people have been on associated with uh, process improvement and some of the benefits and some of the uh, challenges that have been encountered. So one of the things I would put to you is that if you're new to Agile, but you've been through some kind of process improvement effort, you probably have a lot more experience and expertise and information to draw on than you might imagine. But there are going to be some differences in the ways in which you'll apply that. So when I first came to the SEI, I was hired into the CMM group. And I read through the CMM dutifully and prepared for my interview. One of the things that I said to Mark Polk, who was the manager of the group and the author of the CMM at the time, was, this reads like a bunch of hypotheses. I'm not seeing the empirical support for the assertions that are made associated with the model. Okay? And somehow, I'm still here today in the SEI. But, but that's the mindset that I came to it with. And for many years, it's been a struggle to develop empirical evidence supporting various forms of process improvement. And I would submit that Agile's in the same state. We have a preponderance of case studies. And that's, I think, Paul mentioned, if you're not going to conferences, you're not getting the latest information. Well, I think this is a venue where case studies are being presented, being discussed. It's what, what's really going on out there. And among, you know, the presentation we just heard, various kinds of industry reports. And so you'll see that. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about Microsoft research. I just became aware of a recent PhD uh, dissertation from VBI. Uh, my friend and colleague Forrest Schulz here, he just hosted a great conference 
uh, earlier this year called Empirical Software Engineering Week, where people who are doing research get together to talk about their results. So some of these studies are going to be ones that I had the opportunity to watch the people present, talk with the presenters and authors, and get their information, and I'll share that with you. Uh, there's the workshops such as what's going on here at the SEI, we've already heard about ADAPT, and then the SEI Agile Collaborators Group. Another source of information or data about how is this working, what does work, what doesn't work. And then finally, and this is something that didn't exist, at least to my knowledge, 20 years ago, we're having and the major vendors uh, with respect to application lifecycle management platforms here, version one, Rally Software, they're able to collect data from a wide variety of users, and they're making that data available and sharing results. And the other one that doesn't wasn't in existence at least long ago is the crash report from CAST Software. And if you don't know about that company, they're a static analysis tool. And they've made CRASH, is an application-related acronym, and it's the CAST Report on Application Software Health. Okay, And so they've taken hundreds of millions of lines of code associated with, I think it's 700 plus applications, run their static analysis. And some of that they've been able to associate with the um, development methodology used. And so I'll talk a little bit about those results. But there's always been this gap. You can measure the practices and perf of, of what somebody's doing, or in days gone by, compliance with a model, right? So you get that kind of implementation. But what then's often missing is what's the performance? What's the actual result, right? And if you get the result side, you don't know what people did to get that. And what we're trying to do is put both of those things together, to know how people are developing software or doing acquisition and what's the outcome. And that's really been the challenge, and that's one of the things that's an imperative for those doing the research and trying to understand what's really working under what circumstances. So I've probably used half of my time. Um, but a couple of case Studies here are happy stories, perhaps. When you see these cartoons, these come from the SEI's Agile Collaboration Colloquia um, that they've done. One is Patriot Excalibur, and so there's a lot of details on this. There was a publication, an article in Crosstalk back in 2004 after they began their uh, Agile adoption and Agile journey. Fast forward 2011, there's an NDIA panel presentation that you can access, and we'll get these resources uh, together and make them available online about their journey and what's happened over time. Well, to the initial uh, software development team was like 10 people with one contractor working. They were in a difficult bind. They realized they needed to do something different, so they started looking at Agile. It's back 2003-2004. We go forward, voluntary adoptions of their software, which supports squadrons, back office operations, uh, sort of information about situational awareness about the readiness of the squadron. The software has been voluntarily adopted now over 600 plus organizations. I will say the other point is, is that the development organization's grown to over 100, so we'll see some stuff about team size, but scaling this up to a larger group of people seems to work, in this example at least. And the other thing is it's endured. It has endured, right? So it's over 10 years that they've stayed with the same philosophy. The practices can adapt and evolve, and indeed that's one of the principles, number 12, right? Reflect a little bit, do some improvement. Okay, so it's not a static thing. It's going to evolve. The whole idea of agility is not just to be nimble on your feet, but to actually get better and deliver value. Okay, so here's one happy, happy story. There's another happy story. So 
I'm going to go on. But not everybody believes in the happy stories and fables, and there can be clashes of culture. Okay, And we've already heard some of this about the need to align. And I, I think about it as the, the interface. And this morning, well, I won't say, but anyway, this morning the term water scrum fall came up. Okay, which obviously you can sort of piece together as perhaps it's either a clash of culture or it's trying to insert something about Agile in this more staid, if you will, traditional methodology. But no matter how you do it, you got interfaces to deal with. Okay, and that's part of what what Karen was talking about. I think Paul mentioned it too, this notion of alignment. So the Agile team might be very proud of their accomplishments and the way that they're producing and measuring and the evidence to support a claim, an assertion of increased productivity, right? But that message doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily being received, okay? And it may not be convincing because it's in an unconventional and unfamiliar form. Okay, now here's the crash story. Um, two slides here on this. <clears throat> And the way to read it is, first off, higher is better. These are box plots for those of you who may not be familiar with this representation. The real thing to understand is that the line through the middle of the box is the median. So half of the reported values are above and half of below. Okay, so for this purpose, just focus on the median. Where's the line in the, in the middle of the box? Um, and so transferability says, to what extent would it be easy for another team to pick up the, and either maintain this uh, particular application, you know, or to pick up and start to help develop it? So that's the idea is it's transfer from one team to the next. What kind of information is available? How clear would it be? You know, and remember, this is from static analysis tools, so it's looking at things like comments and the, and the structure of the code. Okay. Likewise, changeability is the same thing. To what extent can this be modified? So again, looking at structural characteristics, to what extent could we, you know, evolve the code? Think about it along those lines. Okay, in both of these cases, you'll notice that the orange box is highlighted for, you know, ease of reading, but the development method associated with the highest scores on that is the waterfall method. It's not agile. Okay? The other point about this finding and this result is that 70% of, again, cast software, so I'm going to be the messenger, and I was asked to maybe provide something that might get people at least thinking a little bit, not necessarily looking for combative discussion, but, but to get to sort of challenge some of what, what might be, you know, going on here, and to also let you know there are other resources and perspectives. I mean, be, be cautious consumers, perhaps. Um, these two factors, violations of them in the static analysis framework, account for 70% of their most recent estimate on technical debt. Okay? So violations associated with transferability and changeability are a major contributor to technical debt as it goes forward. Now, it's not all bad news, because when we look at the total quality index, of course, it's not bad news. It's just the news, right? Um, what we see is when we factor in and look at their total quality index, that's not only the transferability and changeability, but robustness, performance, and security. And these are things that they associate with overall business risk, right? Then the distinctions between, and then just focus here, Agile and Waterfall really don't come out to be significantly different. Although I would notice that there's an, uh, the box does extend down further, suggesting there's greater variability associated with the Agile and Waterfall. 
Okay, shifting gears just a little bit because I want to talk about measurement, so I had to say something about it given my background. Uh, and this comes from Larry Mascherone from Rally Software. Now, he labeled this the seven deadly sins of agile measurement, and I put a different title on it. I called it pitfalls of measurement because, you know what, it's not just agile measurement that has these problems. The very first one, you know, don't beat people over the head with their measures or you may not get like honest information. Bob Grady from Hewlett Packard was writing about this notion back in the late 80s, okay, early 90s. The idea is, is that if you want measurement data to be useful, first is think about the what's in it for me, the WIFM, okay, right? The value is going to go back to the person who's generating the data. If it's just going to a, you know, a black hole being reported up, what's the motivation, you know, especially if people are busy? How much time are they going to spend on this topic? Okay, and you can see, you know, the second one's about balance scorecard. Um, believing metrics can replace thinking. I'll tell you another thing from my experience. Don't think that some model and framework is going to absolve you of responsibility either. Okay? If you, you know, th what was the opening discussion here? Agile's about a set of principles. You might think about it as a quality, as a characteristic. Okay? If you start thinking about it as a tool, Okay, what happens when you start to have the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer? You really think all the world's a nail? Okay, so don't think about it as a tool. The set of principles, the Agile Manifesto, okay, think about it as qualities or a state that you want to achieve, but not as, as a tool. So don't let it replace your thinking. And don't think that it absolves you of anything. Okay? Oh, we were doing Agile. That's not my fault. No. I don't care what you're doing. <laughs> okay. Um, and, yeah, using, I mean, the rest of these probably are pretty obvious to uh, so I'm not going to dwell on that. Some myth busters. And this is one of the nice things. I talked about what's new these days about people having data. Well, this too comes from an analysis out of Rally. And, um, and for the version one folks, I'll get to you later too. So equal opportunity. Um, but here, the, the, one of the nice things is this is based on their analysis of over 9,200 teams, okay? And the way that their transactions and interactions are, you know, recorded, the kind of data that they're able to collect in terms of being an application lifecycle management platform provider, okay? And so they're just looking at things like the first one has to do with some scrum philosophy and that points and hours are better than points alone. And what they were basically doing is correlating the practices as they can infer them from the data with their, their basic performance measures associated with responsiveness and quality and predictability and productivity, okay? And so that's the way to look at this. And so they were just looking to say what things have been busted, what things are, are confirmed and where might there be some just, you know, sort of indistinguishable kinds of or, uh, lack of conf confirmation, if you will. And so you can see, you know, the dedication is important. Keeping the teams stable is clearly important. You know, work in progress, lower is always better. Mixed kind of result, especially when you start to think about predictability and productivity. So there may be some times where you want to violate what some of the particular um, methodologies have to say is the desirable practice. Um, 
and the team size. And this is interesting because we actually did some comparison of this against uh, some TSP team software process data. And the ranges are really very, very similar too. So there seems to be, you know, if we had another talk about looking at the team software process and that's an SEI method um, for developing software that has very good results and a lot of empirical support, but the team size is very comparable. Okay, some other sources of information that you might tap and look at. Um, the GAO, so there was a GAO report in 2012 about challenges in applying Agile. And they took 32 uh, practices and went and interviewed uh, people in five different agencies to say, what's your experience been? How's this going? And what they came up with, and I'll show the actual list later on, is 10 practices were being used and deemed effective out of the list of 32, and that there were a number of challenges being identified associated with the adoption and implementation of Agile. And so you've got team transition issues, guidance and adoption. I think we've heard a little bit about this, the need for um, executive support and sponsorship, right? The interface with the customer in an acquisition, you know, do they trust? Well, you know, what are the Agile teams doing to earn the, the trust? How does that interface work when it's unfamiliar? Um, and adapting to the rapid pace of agile development, dealing with the iterations, and then committing the acquisition staff to be the product owners or the you know the customer representative that interface and sustaining that that participation and collaboration. And then the last one you've already heard about and know about, I believe, is it right for everybody? Um, I don't know. What do you think? How am I doing so far? Okay. Well, then I... Questions? No. Um, okay. But is it right for everybody? And though it's been this characterization, this dichotomy laid out, you know, between the traditional world and the agile world. And this comes from Microsoft, where they've been looking at their adoption of agile since 2006. And they have these trend lines, and you can see they're sort of squiggling around a little bit. Um, you know, they say usage is increasing. It's interesting because I'll show you what they actually conclude out of the report. Do people like it? Yes, people like it. Is it a life-changing event? Mm, not necessarily life-changing event. Uh, the benefits, and I know these are eye charts. Uh, but the, the basic point here is that there's a lot of agreement on the right-hand side is the non-Agile practitioners at, this t at the time of the survey. It's their answers. And on the left-hand side is the Agile developers. And basically, the amount of green is the people who are saying, yes, we agree. Okay, and then there's a variety of, of benefits here. And, and the top one is improved communication. And so you can sort of see how that, that might be the case. Although the non-developers also, also, well, they agree with that benefit as well. And then the perceived problems, same kind of layout. And what I want to get to is what are the results or what are the conclusions from the authors? Let me, let me make sure to put it that way. The growth has been slower than expected. Um, they don't feel any individual agile practice exhibited strong growth trends over the course of time. Both the agile and non-agile practitioners agreed on the relative benefits and problem areas. However, and you know, the non-Agile practitioners are less enamored, I like this, of the benefits and more strongly in agreement with the problem areas. Well, you might expect that, okay? And there's a concern about scaling up. Now, apart from this part of the results, 
there were some other things about, it, maybe it's not exactly the scaling up, but it goes back to the qualities. Okay? There is some concern when there's strong um, statu statutory compliance required of the products that they need to lay on more process to make sure. So you might think about privacy, you might think about the, um, having products sold in U Europe and the whole PII kind of kind of issue. When those are concerns, then they bring in extra layers, if you will, of process to assure compliance around those, those kinds of issues. So you might think about that not only in terms of privacy, but some of other, some of the other illities, if you will, or quality characteristics that we know DOD systems must have. Okay. Okay, so, you know, here's a quick rundown about the notion of fit in traditional versus agile. And, I, yeah. So, here's, here's the point about this, because I think people are pretty familiar with these, these things, and you might think about this, right? You, you agree these might be some of the characteristics you know, consistent, you know, traditional approach as we're thinking about it, waterfallish, it's consistent with the 5,000 and the, I, I always get the image of the wall chart to, and kudos to the uh, DAU folks who I know are here. Thank you. Um, it's a lot of information and it's a, it's, it's a, perhaps not a trivial thing to try and represent graphically. So I appreciate having that. Um, you know, programs with stable requirements, right? We're talking about stability because we have these long lead times, if you will, long development times. You know, the technology is evolving slowly. The requirements are stable. That seems to be where, it's, where it, it suits, if you will, the development um, requirements. Okay, agile, you know, we're, we talk about dealing with uncertainty and with risk, the fail fast idea. Do a little, get some feedback, you know. The customer may not be uncertain. We need to be able to think about, you know, there's a future out there, but we don't want to invest so heavily in one direction and then have the world change and not be able to adapt and, and, and move in that direction, right? That seems to be where, where Agile works. So keep these in mind. I'm going to and this is shamelessly taken from my colleague, Epex and Rod, I guess, uh, at the SEI. But both waterfall and agile developments have risks. So let's look at waterfall, and you can see sort of the waterfallish in the uh, in the diagram. And basically, you know, there's a cost associated with over analysis uh, up front. It can then design, you know recreate uh, delays in designs and then, you know, just sort of cascades on and we miss opportunities. We miss the opportunity to react to our customers' changing needs and deliver value. Agile, on the other hand, right, we talked a little bit about what happens with the crash report. Okay, and some of the architectural, perhaps, aspects of it. So you end up with accumulated, you know, suboptimal architecture. Again, not a given, a risk, right? Lack of communication and clear requirements impact capabilities delivered as we move on. Okay, we'd hope we can, uh, that Agile uh, counters that communication aspect to the customer, but as we saw with the GAO report, that continues to be a challenge, and particularly in DOD acquisition environment. So there's consequences associated with that. Well, can we create something that takes the best of both worlds, if you will, a synergy? Um, and for those of you Six Sigma type folks, you might think of Pew concept development, okay? Some way of looking at competing alternatives to say, can we synthesize a stronger solution out of their, their strengths and start to eliminate weaknesses in each of the individual ones? Okay, so synthesize solutions. So what about, 
modifying Scrum, okay? And I, you know, this is just, I saw this presented. Um, it's about a Finnish telecom company, and the cover slide said Scrum Butt. And this was the graphic, okay? And, so, and you know what the story is about Scrum Butt. You know, we're doing Scrum. Okay, so, you know, tailoring an adaptation to local circumstances. And so this was a study where they went into this telecom company. They're developing complex um, products, right? And basically what they found is, yeah, the company, you know, did things a little bit differently than the defined methodology. And so they found a couple of mismatches, but the company itself said, these these were these were deviations, if you will, um, or adaptations that were actually delivering value to the company and had to do with dealing with the nature of the products that they were developing, right? And so it had to do with closing out users' stories and doing them as soon as possible to make more effective resource utilization of the programmers on staff. And the other part had to do with the length of time that user stories were open. Only 28% of the user stories were closed within one iteration, and 74% of them were, were closed within three iterations. Okay, so the people, you know, I mean, what, what I find encouraging about this, right, you start, everybody has trouble getting started, but then you've got to make it your own, and you have to figure out how to be successful. Okay, and this is the other part of the Microsoft, and don't try to read the lines or anything. Um, but the, 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 the interesting part is, is if you look across the parallelism, if you will, the, the horizontal connections, the agile development teams and non-agile development teams, well, they're all doing code reviews. It's the number one thing, right? They're all doing unit testing. They're all doing automated builds, right? I mean, what it says to me, agile or otherwise, Microsoft has a pretty strong development culture, okay? And the methodology, particular methodology being used sort of modifies it around the edges. The biggest, steepest line has to do with the use of um, the stand, daily stand-ups, okay? So it makes some sense. Version 1, thank you very much. Um, and by the way, I didn't really plan this. I didn't look to see who was a sponsor. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I'm, an, I'm an FFRDC guy. I don't endorse anything. Um, and so that's, that's my disclosure part of this. Uh, yeah, I, I, but anyway, thank you very much because it's great to have the data and to be able to see. So this is interesting. Um, again, right off of the website, you know, what are the most practiced techniques? And there's a lot more in the report. Daily stand-ups, iteration planning, unit testing, and so forth. Again, if I stop and think back about the notion of must it be done in a pure form, one of the interesting observations about the chart is where the percentages actually begin. Right? They start at 85, they drop down to 75, and they go down from there. So no, nothing is universal, okay? There's a lot of stuff being practiced. There's a lot of agreement. You know, we see that. I just saw that, too, in the Microsoft stuff. But nothing is truly universal. Okay. <laughs> Bringing this up to scale. And I don't have a whole lot to say, but I was, I was sort of very interested to hear um, Karen's comments about the way that they're scaling and broadening the application of Agile across the enterprise. So that was good. The, the, point, the point here simply being that what people were doing is identifying where those issues are, what are the requirements or the needs of the organization, and developing the techniques and integrating them or synthesizing them to try and come up with a, a good solution, if you will, for their, their organization. Um, 
And one of the other resources which you can Google the information at the top of the slide, the URL at the bottom, um, goes to some work from the, the SCI on Agile at scale and is really oriented more towards technical practices. Uh, I'll leave that. And thank you very much, sir. I'm going to skip this. <laughs> What do you got to do to be successful? Well, one of the things I think is attend forums like this, understand what are the characteristics of your organization. If you're the round peg, right, are you going to try, are you fitting into a square hole or a round circle? Okay. What's going, what are your entry conditions, if you will? So if you're agile, you know, what, how are you going to interface or what do you need to do to adapt and the rest of the organization or how are you going to interface with the rest of the organization? And so I'm coming back to this same old theme. The traditional approach. So if you're in an organization that looks like this, you know, you do things in a very standardized way. You have comparability. You have repeatability, right? You have con contracts that create specific milestones and deliverables so you can verify progress, right? And so that's basically the environment, the world, you know, that you're living in. That's the strength of your organization. Okay, are these strengths or challenges if you want to move to an agile paradigm or an agile approach? Because if these are the strengths and you're going up against this and you're going to try and change the world, you better be prepared. You know, you better understand where you're headed, okay? And likewise, the weaknesses. Now, the weaknesses might be your friends, okay? And so you might think about it from that perspective, right? Driving measurement of compliance. Okay, for years, uh, I wanted to make the connection to value, Right. How many of you have been in an organization that's been through a CMMI appraisal? Okay. And so, you know, that's more of a compliance rather than value-driven or performance-driven appraisal process or assessment process, right? Now what we're trying to do is get things onto a basis where we can say, Okay, if the process is, uh, drives measurement of compliance, you may have something to offer. Okay, if there's a lack in measurement of value and performance. So if you can come in with that argument and show how Agile's going to do that, then that's a real benefit. It seems to me that that's something we're all seeking in these days, right? It's not enough to be compliant. We need to perform, and we need to perform better. And just like previous process improvement um, methods have done and tried to do, you know, Six Sigma, you know, CMMI, okay, what we really want to be able to do is tie what we're doing to performance. Principle 12, okay, go back to the Agile principles, you know, and extend it a little bit. Okay, the Agile approach, early insight, what are its strengths? Okay, now if you're trying to say what do I do to be successful, if I know, have we had problems in terms of early insights or do we wait until we're inside the tunnel and the light's coming down the track, right? So this, again, may be things that you can uh, play off of, you know, the fail-fast notion, uh, course correction. But just like the Finnish telecom, you know, understand, are you going to just take the whole methodology, absolve yourself, and just do it, 
or are you going to try and tailor and adapt and understand the situation and make it work? And I think that's also a lot of what we heard out of out of Karen, what's going on at NGA. Uh, and then be prepared. Address the weaknesses, okay? This question about availability of actively engaged users and customers is one that really was highlighted in the GAO report about the agency experiences that they interviewed. But here's what they found, the 10 practices. And so again, perhaps an eye chart, but start with agile guidance and an adoption, an agile adoption strategy. That means sense where you're going. Understand what's my, what are the conditions? What's the climate, the culture? We've heard this. And I would argue that if you've been through a previous process improvement, you've dealt with all this stuff before. So you do have resources and experience and expertise to tap on. Um, not going to go through the entire list because I am over. Uh, but I wanted to point out number seven. Okay, include requirements related to security and progress monitoring in your queue of unfinished work backlog. I think that's too narrow. Okay. I think all the quality attributes need to be represented in there. And this isn't just an agile thing. I mean, this is a software development, systems development issue, okay? But it needs to be in there. And if you're going to be doing things in this way, you gotta get people to attend to it. Agile or otherwise, you don't test security in. You don't test safety in. There's a design element of this that has to be done up front. Okay. And then these roles. Now, I'll just take one quick minute. You know, they're the same on either side. You can probably read faster than I'm going to talk, so I'm not going to say much except to say think about the roles. Think about them on the developer side, on the acquisition side, and they're important. Okay, I think too often we want to provide training, not coaches. Okay, teams need coaches. Okay, teams need coaches. So th keep that in mind, whether it's for the ac acquirer or for the developer. Okay, and somebody has to be doing the, the managing up. Okay, so the champions, you know, that's another important role. And please measure the work you're doing and be able to share it, use it, improve. You know, and the first and foremost is it's for you. Okay. Don't, don't worry about it going up. Do what you need to do to get better. Okay. Get the feedback and deliberately improve. Don't just change. Okay. Takeaways. It can be effective. Is it universally effective? Mm, I'm not convinced. Uh, is it a silver bullet? No, I don't think that either. Uh, is it conducive to every situation? I would say choose judiciously and wisely, perhaps. Uh, but we've certainly seen an effort here where they're trying to go enterprise-wide, you know, and more than just the term, by the way, you know, like, yeah, that's not agile. <laughs> okay. So, you know, keep that in mind. It is a different mindset. It's going to take some culture change, right, in terms of 5,000 contracting. Uh, I was impressed that the lawyers were we're thinking about this, I'd be honest. Okay, and it's not just, you know, it's not a trivial undertaking, so don't go into it as those expecting it to be that way. And for more information, contact Mary Ann, because she's leading the Agile uh, Collaborators Group. And thank you very much.